Yes, ma'am. Uh, are we live? Yes, ma'am, we are. So friends, welcome to this very first webinar of the Dr. Bhavda Dilad Museum. Uh, we are also joining to the, the whole troop, uh, trying to reach out to the world and to reach out to all of you, uh, especially today because it is uh, International Museums Day uh, tomorrow and it is International Week this week. In fact, ICOM gave it a special uh, aspect of, of, of inclusivity and togetherness. So the webinar title is The Future of Art Exhibitions in Public Spaces, Museums and Biennales. Uh, and the idea really is that we, we have had a shock to the system. We all know that. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that has never happened before. So when we step out into the world after lockdown, this is really not even post COVID. We're talking about now, very shortly, many places around the world will, will in, in a couple of weeks or some have even started, will step into the real world, but into a completely changed real world. A world where the whole social interaction is going to be very diff different. And, and for art, especially for art, this is going to have a um, profound impact. We know, just to give you a little background, we know that the art fairs have closed, of course, galleries have closed, a lot of biennales have been postponed, a lot of art fairs are not even sure whether they will survive uh, because it depends on the economy. A lot of this depends on the economy. And again, the economy has taken a body blow. So it's not just institutions, but everything. And we depend also a lot on the economy. So I would like to um, also just mention that we, in today, the, the, we have to be far more aware and conscious of our environment and the kind of carbon footprint that we have. And the New York Times, for example, talking about biennales and as well as these spectacular exhibitions that we have in most museums abroad, the kind of heavy carbon footprint that we have because we're traveling around the world, we're meeting people. Um, so, and that engagement will obviously change. That, of course, is the fun part of it. And that's what energizes uh, museums and biennales. That's what gives it its, its, um, its chutzpah and its, um, its uh, 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 USP, sorry. And so, um, so that, that will change completely. Um, and I, I'm just, we have three wonderful panelists to, um, to address this question. Now, most of you know the panelists. We've also put it out in our mailers, but just very quickly, Shudabrata Sengupta, who is in front of the uh, bookcase, uh, who is uh, just who last curated the Shanghai Biennale and is curating the Yokohama Biennale, which is going to open on the 3rd of July. And so um, I wonder how he is going to respond because he is eminent, just imminently going to have to deal with that. Gayatri Sinha, who is the founder director of, uh, of, the, of uh, uh, the Critical Collective, uh, a wonderful archive, uh, and if you don't know it, I would suggest you immediately become members of it. And uh, uh, Nikhil Chopra, who has just spent several weeks at the Met, who's a wonderful performance artist, but of course involved with many other things as well. So friends, so Shuda, can we start with you? How, how are you going to deal with this? Because you are really going to land, I mean, it's just right around the corner in a sense. Um, yeah, I'd like to begin with a small correction. I am not the curator of the forthcoming Yokohama Triennial. The, the Rax Media. Media Collective is. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, you're right. A part of the triangulation. <clears throat> so um, I was just thinking, we were chatting before, and you said um, uh, the Kochi Biennale is also, go is also going to go ahead. Um, it says both, and the Kochi Biennale uh, right. has said that they will plan to go ahead. And I think that's an interesting st um situation to think about uh, given the fact that let's you take the example of the Kochi Biennale they actually went through a devastation in the last edition as well they had the floods which were uh, equally crippling in some ways um, infrastructurally it, it made for a very fragile situation and they decided that in the last instance that they will continue and I think that that's a that's a stance that I am 
Um, I'm not saying that one, and I don't think it was a foolhardy stance. The Yokohama Triennial also has been through situations before that were quite difficult. It went through in the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster. There was an edition of the Yokohama Triennial. Right. That's right. And um, in, in our understanding and talking to our colleagues in Yokohama, they persistently said that um, in the wake of very difficult times like what we are in right now, this, what people don't often acknowledge is the fact that there is also a great desire and a demand for artistic reflection. There is a felt necessity, uh, especially amongst populations who are slightly older or who are very young and have never been through situations like this before to, to, to actually hunger for artistic reflection, for literature, for poetry, for music. So this is a time when um, instead of taking a back seat, we could also consider the ways in which artistic activity, of course, attenuated differently, takes a front seat. So let's take the example, if the Kochi Biennale had decided in the aftermath of the floods that they would not go on, we would have all been understanding of the decision. We would have all said, yes, the extremely difficult circumstances. Um, and yes, they need not go on. But, you know, I mean, my earliest formation was in, in theater as a teenager. And anyone who's been in theater knows that there's that thing, you know, a show must, must go, go on. on, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how it goes on, what we do to make things safe and, um, and humane for everybody and fair for everybody is the question that we all have to address. But to say um, that things must not go on, I mean, the world has been through a lot in the last 10, 15 years. We've had wars, we've had other epidemics, we've had um, natural disasters. <clears throat> we haven't seen the metropolitan centers of the art world crumble and decide to sort of sit down. They're doing so now because in some ways the situation has hit them as well as it has hit the rest of the world. So it, as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it is a situation where everybody in the world in the art community has to do some thinking and reflection, but it's not for me an excuse to shut things down. We can talk about what we in the Yokohama Triennial are going to do later, but I can come back to later once we hear from the other panelists as well. I, I, I really, I, uh, Shuddha, I really relate to the idea of uh, the, that the show must go on. Um, and the question is what that show would be then uh, and how uh, it must go on. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about it, especially since a lot of my practice sits within the live space. And it's so much about actually actually feeling the, 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 the spray that flies from the mouth yeah. and actually feeling the p and the b of the breath um, as, it, as, it sits, as it comes to you, even if you're a distant audience, you know, I think that it's really uh, that visceral experience in, in a sense is extremely, extremely important. But, you know, in a sense, uh, one of the ways in which that the show can go on is uh, I, I, I like the idea of, of the front seat, but I also kind of like the idea of movement, not just being forward or be considered to be moving in a particular trajectory, but movement can also be backward. And I think both of those uh, uh, require, I think, a completely different way of understanding how our practices uh, kind of take shape, um, but it has, allowed, it has allowed me a lot of time uh, to, to, ref to, to reflect also about the various live events that I was part of. Uh, if I was to think about the context in which a lot of these exhibitions would happen are in this context of the festival. There, there is a sense of festivity and there's this idea of, of people coming together you know, in some of the most festive occasions where some of the maximum number of people have gathered, I feel in what we present as artists and as an exhibition, I feel sometimes gets lost in this social milieu, in the idea of the opening, in the idea of, 
not just looking at the art, but looking at oneself and looking at each other and socializing. And I think perhaps this new order might allow us to deviate for a second from this idea of being a collective and a large audience to kind of shrinking ourselves down to a smaller audience. And I don't think there's something lost there. I think that perhaps we can think about this as something gained there. You know, I think that this something can be as powerful for an audience of six over 60 hours that you stagger through. And there are ways in which I think we can think about making potent connections with those that are present. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I hope that that can continue because I am planning those events. I am already thinking about how performance would not have more than four or five people present in a room. And what would that mean? Uh, because there have been circumstances where I've had four or five people in a room and those moments have been as strong as a room full of people. So I hope that this gives us a chance to think about the how of the show and the what of the show as much as the show itself. Um. I, I, I was interested in this uh, question of, um, if I may, I was interested in this question of, uh, Tasneem brought up the word spectacular, and I'm thinking that, um, and Nikhil sort of expanded on this, and if we can just take this idea further, how there is so much performativity built around an event which um, lends it its aura. It is this, you know, the great aura that surrounds a major biennale or a major museum opening, uh, the performativity involved in the clothing, in the, uh, uh, in just the act of being present, um, and even the challenge that the biennale will set. I mean, if I have to come to the Yokohama Triennale and I can afford to come there for two or three days, but or Kuchi, and if there are 80 or 90 artists and there's maybe 100 hours of viewing and there are um, so many works of art, maybe 100 works of art, the fact that you absorb so much less or that the process of selection already suggests that in your own mind you have broken up the Biennale or the Triennale into much smaller consumable bits. Now, if one can get away from this, if one can separate the spectacularism to a certain extent, and what experience we might have had in these last few weeks is of seeing how events can go online, the freeze or bar, art Basel, etc. They come online and the participation can increase. So if the sort of, you know, the dropping, uh, the going up of the proscenium curtain of the grand event, that is held in partial abeyance. But in fact, you do something else. You allow in many more people. So even if you have the formality of a grand opening, what you should actually be doing is also through, through the camera, allow in many, many thousands of people across the world who cannot attend the event to actually go through the forthcoming Yokohama Triennial, for instance. And therefore, audience viewership does not shrink, it actually increases. You can have the live participation of the crowds who can make it there, but also those who can't. And I'm wondering why we haven't done this already. Why, uh, why we are not allowing the aura of the, you know, the exclusivity of the event to actually disperse and become a much more, much more loose at the edges and allow much more inclusion and that. So if you're performing live in front of six people, Nikhil, but maybe, 6,000 across the world could be yes. seeing you otherwise. There would be simultaneity. And I think this would also lead to, um, you know, what tends to happen with the, that the knowledge production around the artworks in major events like biennials, which are always stressed for time and you're rushing and it's hot and sweaty and there are crowds in front of you everywhere. Isn't it possible that the knowledge production in this kind of two-step intervention, whereby uh, I could maybe read pages about things even before, I get to see them. And I think we should use this facility of uh, receiving digitally in the way that we used to receive art earlier. Maybe, uh, maybe I don't know how, maybe in the 50s or 60s, people didn't go to biennials and triennials, certainly from countries like India, they saw things in books. What the book did do was it gave you information. It gave yeah. you knowledge. So I'm, it's not just yeah. a little label in the dark and then coming home with the big tome of the catalog that you don't often always go back to because there's such a time lag between artwork and their reception. So if this can be somehow, there can be a better, healthier, and a more generous or democratic balance between who can attend the event and who can't, but also gets to see. 
So uh, that's a very good point, uh, uh, Gayatri, but it, it works for a small group of people, for institutions and for cities that support Biennales. Uh, footfall is this the, the critical thing that brings in the funding. Politicians would not be interested in funding either Biennales or, um, or museums or giving them the funding for the museums uh, programming and which supports a lot of the artists uh, if the footfall wasn't there and the footfall involves paying for a ticket. Now in the case of Bhavda Jilad, our ticket is only 10 rupees, but it is very much the footfall that determines our ability to go out to private donors and get funding, which then enables us to do the kind of programming that we do. So there is this absolutely, there is this dichotomy, this, this tension um, that at one level, the idea of slow looking, like Nick has said, um, it, it, it is very much, uh, uh, you know, enables a much perhaps a deeper interaction and perhaps the technology, the positive part of the technology will be uh, that, that people will, will, will want to learn more and want to know more and want to visit more. But it also, so I want to address another question to you about the concern that I have about technology is that it's going to reduce that whole physical experience. Of course, that's that we all know. And, and people increasingly, if you look at it, <clears throat> the experience is it's very fractured. It's very limited. Their in, engagement span is limited. Um, it's very gamified in a sense. Um, so because the, the larger audiences that you're talking about might, that might come in, I'm not sure that they, they actually <clears throat> have that sustainability that you are suggesting, you know, the, the ability to engage uh, in depth uh, um, with, with the artworks because their, their whole online experience is so um, time bound. You know, it's very in, 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 in just little bites. And I wonder what, 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 what you might have to say about that, you know, maybe you guys, we can respond to that or Shuddha or Nikhil. You know, on a critical collective. Oh, it is to change it, sorry, yeah. So on critical collective, we have, you know, because we send out newsletters, we send out three newsletters every month, we can get to see um, what is the time, or what is the amount of uh, the attention span on the page? Or what is the, the you know, each user is spending how much time looking at the, the the attention that is being given to a particular thing. Now, the average tends to be three, 3.5 minutes, which is possibly much more than the amount of time that you're going to be spent looking at a work of art. And Tasneem, I think your patrons would be quite happy with their branding or whatever they like to call it, being seen on a screen as much as live when uh, people actually come to the Bahadaji lab. I don't have to physically come there to take away the message that this has been patronized. Just as viewership of uh, sports events is sold across the world, uh, I'm sure that the viewership of art events can also be sold. It can also be marketed. And in that sense, it can bring in the money. It can also save artworks. And I hope it can save cities like Venice, which are sort of, you know, that's the dark side of the carnivalesque moment of the great Biennale, where you have this entire Biennale city, which is uh, suffering because of its, uh, because of this, this, this unholy nexus between art event and tourism, which can make the living space actually unlivable. So if there is a distributed mechanism, either, either you have a large enough hinterland so that you can distribute the artworks or you distribute it spatially through the digital world. And if you use this mechanism to, you know, allow people to put in money, uh, either to allow, you know, the American Association of Museums, will they pay and allow so many households in the United States to actually look at the Kochi Biennale, if they support something like this, there would be any number of possibilities. We have to start thinking. Uh, well, I, I hope you're right. That's a good part of it. Please, <laughs> can I add on to this as well? Because I, I've been doing a little bit of thinking about this. I think the um, what no one is really thinking about is the fact that footfall will increase tremendously in a few years' time. Historically, mm -hmm. if you look at museums and exhibition spaces and their relationship to crises, there is a kind of curve of, you know, like a steady curve, then comes a crisis, everything goes down. When people start coming out of the crisis, you always have more people visiting 
institutions of public culture than they did before. That's been the case. And you look at the history of modern museums, they've always, in a sense, they've had a relationship to these ups and downs of crisis moments. Museum of Modern Art begins on the 7th of November, 1929 in New York. The Spanish flu epidemic seized by around 1921, 22, starting in 17. So let's say give or take three years, five years, two years in some places. You cannot have had an institution of the nature that the MoMA is without people thinking about that museum already in 1918, 19. And if one looks at the history of the MoMA, you realize that they began thinking about it in the middle of the Spanish flu epidemic. Similarly, if you take an exhibition like Documenta, it opens within a few, within a year or two years of this end of the Second World War in Germany where everything is destroyed, and people think uh -huh. in five, six what? years, five, six years, five, six years, 50s, early 50s, 52, 52. Yeah, 52. it opens in 52. But I'm saying that the preparation for it must have begun at least a year or so before. I know it was a horticultural exhibition, horticultural show. <laughs> given the fact that it was in Germany and given the fact that the, the uh, Bode who started it was a meticulous plan, I, I think his ideas would have germinated earlier. And again, post-war, post-Second World War Germany is actually a, a situation rife with public health issues. There's typhus, there's cholera, there's tuberculosis, which is breath spread. And these were all made worse by the war. There are large numbers of people in prisoner of war camps. They're in congested conditions. And this is the public that is being imagined by um, someone like Arnold Bode or the people who produced MoMA. And what I really want to stress is that if you look at, let's say, and I've been thinking a lot about this, that the institutions that, for instance, the way Germany has dealt with the question of support for culture. This is the most important thing. Yeah. The German government has actually recognized the fact that museums have taken a hit, that cultural institutions are not in a good place, but they've created subventions so that the, um, the ticket, the, the footfall um, problem can be compensated in some ways by, by museums. And that this time, this time of perhaps retreat is also spent. I mean, it's also a time of lower budget outlays and maintenance. Let's not forget that for large museums. Some of those resources can be spent in bursaries stipends for younger artists, for younger curators, time to stock and do inventories of their collections, time to actually research their collections so that when things open, they are in a better position to actually welcome a more vibrant, active public. In our case with the Yokohama Triennial, there's been, I mean, like I said, we were, did we have to rethink our curation? Yes and no. No, because we've never had um, a desire to create these opening night spectacular uh, triennales. We've, whenever we've curated, that has never been our focus. As our focus has been, um, has been to, to, to create long durée events, to create processual situations, to create incubatory processes. And in a, a strange, kind of synchronicity or uncanniness, if you like. One of the ideas that we thought about for the Yokohama Triennial was toxicity. Um, and it's been in our discussions with our artists since almost more than a year now. So, and that was both thinking in terms of the context of Japan, but also in thinking in terms of touchability and untouchability and the histories of caste in India. And the questions of care and how they become foregrounded at a time when often in many countries there are aging or disabled populations who need to think about care and the aesthetics of care. These are questions that we were dealing with with our artists. So in some ways, very strangely, we were prepared, at least in our minds and in our imaginations when this hit. So many of the work, I mean, people will say, are their works responding to this moment? 
I can't say there are works responding to this moment because they were in preparation already, but they were in preparation for the questions that this moment raises. So there's some strange uncanny prescience. Um, finally, let me say that in just for this round to say that when we began opening, we, we had like Gayatri suggested, we began with a series of soft moves. So they're episodes and we started with an episode zero zero that actually opened in the, in the fall last year with a publication that was the source book of the, of the triennial, which included a lot of our thinking. So instead of having one big catalog that comes sort of towards the end of an exhibition, we, we decided to spread out the process of the reflective journey. I just saw today that the Guangzhou Biennale is also taking the time of postponement to produce a series of publications. These are all methods that all of us can be trying out to actually stretch you know, some years ago in Rux, we had written a text called um, The Earthworm Dances Perspectives for a Slow Motion Biennale. And um, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that some of those ideas now begin to take on a strange relevance. But the experience of time, the experience of intensity, um, dispersal of allowing lesser people more time to be in a space of allowing for a gentler, more attenuated presence rather than the, you know, the clickbait of, um, of how many people come in and out of the turnstiles. I think these are ways in which we have to rethink, not just biennales and museums, but the experience of art itself. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the museum in uh, Kerala, which houses uh, Ravi Verma's uh, artifacts and his, I mean, his main paintings had this, uh, uh, the Swat, Swati uh, Tirunal uh, museum space, it had this uh, system of counting how many people came to see his shows, but that everybody who came in dropped in a stone. And at the end of it, they counted the stones and that's how you knew how many footfalls there were. Now, it's, I think what um, what's happening in, uh, let's, I mean, you know, we all talk about MoMA and there's this visualization of the number of uh, the queues outside and this is the monolithic building and its illumination, etc. It's something like it's it's it is a landmark of um, world art practice. What's been happening on the ground in India is significantly different. So we started a project by looking at what we call the Millennial Museum, and what has happened in India since the millennium in terms of museum making. It's quite extraordinary. We have over fifty museums already in our list. Two of them are. Um, have you know the aspiration, the skill, the monetary input, which was the more recent Patna Museum, and uh, ten years earlier the Kiranada Museum of Art. At the two ends of the spectrum, the well-funded government museum, the well-funded private museum. But at least forty-eight others are museums which were so small that now the question of will there be more footfalls or will there be less footfalls is almost immaterial but they start to address what a society seems to want for itself. And I think this is one of the critical questions about what is the logic of the museum? Why do you have a museum? Is the museum simply a repository of, well, expensive and highly desirable and rare artworks or does it answer something deeper within the community? Uh, so if we look at classical Indian art, we have no, almost no record of trauma. The history of trauma is not recorded um, the great, um, you know, the great movements eastward by the Cholas or uh, the terrible sort of um, uh, conflicts among the Rajputs in, across north of India. You have, may have one Chitorgar, you may have one this or one that, but we do not record trauma as a subject. It, that has started to be done now in this, in this century. So the, tra the museum dedicated to trauma, whether it is the trauma of the brain and the brain museum, or the trauma of the conflictorium, or the trauma of Bhopal, these are individual initiatives or even the trauma of partition. Uh, then the, the domestic collectible, as we see with the Jharu Museum, or we see with the utensils museum, which is such an interesting museum. They actually have a professional curator, you know, who's trained in MSU Baroda. It's an open museum, apart from the tile sort of roof, but it has no walls. It has 6,000 objects of rare utensils. Some of them yeah. are a thousand years old. Yeah. And that is how you, you can receive works of art. I think much will depend <coughs> upon the genius of Indian collecting. How, is, how are people going to see? So perhaps these two categories, the Biennale and the museum in terms of our anxieties around them, 
need to be put into separate buckets and looked at almost separately. Uh, just, but, you know, just sorry, please. No, I mean, Go I ahead. just wanted to briefly uh, sort of posit a few instead of the gloom and doom scenario of how one might actually think of this situation more productively. I mean, I, I noticed that the Bhada Jilad Museum is actually doing something really interesting by talking about what is called incorrectly, in my opinion, social distancing through your clay model collections, right? You've, you've, <laughs> and that's an interesting point of discussion about how uh, these, you know, these arrangements of figurines could actually be a starting point for a conversation about what is distance and what that's is what they are. Yeah. Or, but on a, on a larger note, if you take the city of Bombay, it's really been marked by architecture in, at least in this country, is profoundly marked by public health trauma. So whether it's Mohammed Ali Road or Baikula, where you sit, is was developed as a result of the bubonic right. plague. Yeah. Yeah. So the That's civic right. planning of Bombay is a complete response to the bubonic plague. Right. Very fascinatingly, Raja Ravi Varma relocates to Bombay, bang in the middle, right at the start of the bubonic plague, 1894, he sets up his studio his brother dies of the plague. And then he sells off the studio to his German technician and gives a sum of money to his technical assistant, a man called Dada Sahib Falke, which then is used to make the first film in India. So you could say that the histories of cinema, of, of popular printmaking, of painting intersect with this, with this strange, you know, the bubonic plague and produce remarkable events. The part of your, your museum's collection, Tasneem, there, there used to be a taxidermy collection at the former that, Victorian Albert Museum. That, that right. now sits in the museum dedicated to the bubonic plague. The Hafkin Institute in Bombay has a museum. It's not very really far from where you are. It is at the CSM, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, these institutions, have been shaped by these crises in a way. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, Nikhil. Yes. What, what, what are your thoughts about well, this? What do you think? Sorry, go ahead. You know, one of the things that uh, that uh, that you brought up, Gayatri, is how, in a sense, perhaps we can, you know, while the institutions and the museums and the biennales are really important as spaces to collect people, and they generally tend to happen in big big centers, like, you know, Kochi is a center, it's, a, it's an old city, uh, it's, a, you know, uh, Venice is a, is a center. And I think that I'm, I'm and, and, and this is part of how I feel like I've lived my own life is sort of wanting to move away in a sense from the center to, to, to kind of leak out of, let's say, uh, a hub, not to create a hub, but to, to, let's say, if I was to think about infecting people with, with creative ideas, I would think that uh, this is an opportunity for us to get a little bit more local uh, and to go into places perhaps that aren't nerve centers and are not places where hundreds and th thousands of people would collect, but to, to, to anti that, you know, because also I think that what happens with big centers and big institutions is that as an artist sometimes who is invited to, to create in these spaces, I'm almost always, always thinking about how I'm expected to create the, the, the resolved, completely well thought out commissioned piece. But when I am in my local community, for example, even within Goa, if I was to, to, to use, you know, the three villages that I'm surrounded by as a playground, you know, I think that we would start to create new ways and new languages in the way in which we connected with people. Because in this locality, with my community, I feel a lot safer to be able to take certain risks and to be able to play with certain ideas that perhaps I would have not had the chance to in an institutional space. So in terms of what we get to exercise as artists, I think have to spread outside of of, of let's say the institution, not to challenge the institution, but to work with it outside of it. Because in the end of the day, I mean, if I can be as presumptuous, this presumptuous, I, we are our very own walking museums. We are containers of all our, all our, all our, all our experience.
are tiny little institutions that we that 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 even our friendships are connected to and our relationships are connected to so you know i would think a housing society in bombay that all has to live together would be actually a fantastic little space to 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 make a little action happen you know to 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 connect with your neighbors and to connect with the six people that perhaps you've never really connected with before so the other danger that i i feel uh, so that so are you suggesting that you would do an art uh, ex- you would do a performance in a space like that nikhil you would go yeah. into the village and 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 actually activate it in a, in a way through yes. through a performance and an artwork so actually yes take i mean we've been doing it to the into the into the village and the street into people's homes as well absolutely I mean, you know, ancestors would say ancestors would say let's you know create exhibitions in our kitchens for example absolutely so, absolutely you know. absolutely and in a sense i feel in a in a way we've been doing that for the past 6 years with hh art spaces it's a house in a village with you know four three three to four artists living there at a time and there is a way in which we can create an interaction that spans through a residency with the series of artists that live there on appointments on you know or even if we are let's say having an event we have it for the wardo for the village so we've been doing that already to a large extent for the past so many years and over and even though our functioning has been so local the 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 effect of that has been in a sense international so yes in a way it connects with what gayatri was saying but i'm also thinking about uh, another another da- another danger with with how the online platform becomes in a sense the only platform for us to take exactly. our communications to our news to our entertainment to our social uh, uh, networking to and then even if we have and then we have to experience an art exhibition or have a seminar of this of this nature uh also online so i'm wondering where what is that threshold where we start to burn out you know where we where this becomes too sterile an experience so i'm thinking perhaps uh shutting the computer and actually just you know looking out of your window i think might be actually an extremely pr- productive uh might be actually very productive so uh, not not from a place of being passive but but and and it was really very insightful to hear uh, shodha's uh, um you know um you know examples of 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 uh, great institutions that have actually been born out from ashes and come out from uh, crises and i i'm really looking forward to that explosive audience that comes out in revenge culture watching you know uh so i'm really looking forward for that moment and i can feel that moment i can feel that that is who we intrinsically are you know you can contain us but as you contain us you fill us up like a dam and you know once you let the gates open we will pour out you know that will happen it's just a matter of time the other thing that i feel is that this may be a really good time for observation and not just observation of our own practices but to just observe people as the door as we open our doors as we start to step out as we start to go as banks open up and schools open up and children start to go back into school and start to resume kind of what we understand as vital activities i think it's important for us to take some notes about how people stand in queues and how people behave around you know market places and you know what is the self responsibility that someone takes because i think to a great extent it has to start from trust you know from being able to trust people to 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 be responsible viewers just as much as we trust people not to touch an artwork you know i think that we have to we have to trust that people will want to create the right environment for themselves to watch because you know even in a performance is the desire in people's eyes to see a performance through that really makes what the performance is so i think we have to foster that um you know i think we have to we have to foster that trust you know so, and observe i think we have to observe how people work um so i just want i want to talk also about technology so the, what what all of you have suggested is that there is this whole very positive aspect to technology of course which also brings in a lot of people it slows down the experience of 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 engaging with art 
But there's also, as we move forward, we are seeing that galleries are doing augmented reality shows that you could see the object in the round, that there's expanded reality XR and AR, and that 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 is being telescoped and it's it's going to happen very quickly because the, the need is there and so companies and uh, are going to respond to that. And, and that also will change how art is produced, I, I, I think. Um, we're, we're, so as two artists, Nikhil and uh, should, I, should I know you did a work, you've done perhaps more works than one, but one that I saw that was at the certain time uh, using sort of AR, um, would, would be how, how would you respond to moving, you know, your, your, for example, you are very involved with, with you know, a sort of body and drawing and, and, and you know, going back to, to traditional ways of expression. Um, so I would love to hear from both of you how that might impact your practice. Yeah. Uh, Nikhil, you want to go first? <laughs> Nikhil, I saw, Nikhil, I saw a performance by you. You were talking about the comforts of the local and you did this wonderful performance in an igloo kind of shape, perhaps, in Sunna Paranta with lipstick. Oh, yeah. Yes. And you were wearing yes. coin cloth and you wrote with perhaps thousands of lipsticks on the inner walls like a wound yes. and you marked yes. it. Yes. and deepening red, yes. the layering of the red, and then yes. the lipstick shells were then thrown into the center and that became yes. a mountainous kind of a pile. Yes. Now, um, yes. technology, the recording of that, its transmission, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Tasneem's question is what does, how does technology affect? I think technology also encapsulates. There is a, a project that was done through photographs and sketches of the 1918 pandemic that was traveling around the world. And it closed in February this year. <gasps> and the curators asked the question, what if another pandemic hits the world? <gasps> and in March, this blows into our faces. So Tasneem, just to sort of come in here yes. and talk about what technology can do is this tremendous capsule. Yeah, Nikhil, but to carry, continue Nikhil. I'm not in feeling impatient at all. I'm not feeling like I need to have that <coughs> answer. Firstly, I, I, I don't feel like I need to have that answer now because I feel that this is a moment like where now needs to be, uh, now is the time where we, where, um, firstly, I'm, I'm really, I feel really fortunate in a sense that I have the versatility to move between, let's say, live art and there is something that is very central to what it is that I do, which is to make drawings. And it's really felt like that, that I've allowed myself to just crawl into my studio and dive deep into that two-dimensional surface on a piece of paper and really go as far in as I can possibly go. So it's been a really, uh, it's been a really uh, a, a time for me to, 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 to hone in on certain qualities. Um, and to a great extent, I'm also, uh, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm also really enjoying the time where I'm not scrambling to make, I'm not working towards a large production or I'm not working towards a performance and I'm not, uh, getting ready to get onto a plane and travel across a continent. You know, I'm, I feel that, and I'm not impatient to find out how this will all pan out. I want to, as I brought up previously, is that I want to be at the, I'd rather start my process with observation because for me, the context is an audience, but also the way in which an audience presents itself and the way in which an audience is in that space and the freedoms they enjoy and how I play with those freedoms that I perhaps deny myself. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen with all of those tensions and how will I be able to communicate what I have to communicate with a mask on my face, perhaps. Um, so, uh, and how will, I, how will I interact with an audience member with also a mask on their face? So I am thinking about, 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 these, about these new forms in a way in which the performances are going to take, but I, I'm all right in, in allowing this to take 
uh, the time it needs to take. Uh, I'm, 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 I want to observe. I want to observe how people come out of their houses. And I want to, I want to see what relationship people start to have with communities. And who's going to be the first one to stick their hand out to say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I, you know, it even starts from just something as simple as that, you know? So I, I want to see how we emerge from our holes and our rooms and our apartments. And, and, and in a sense, that will, that will determine a new context for me. And that, is, that I have to wait and see. So that quickly, because we will have to go for questions in a few minutes. So please, your Very response. Quickly. Um, I keep going back to the Spanish flu because I am convinced that it has something to do with the birth of cinema. And certainly in India, it did. But even in, uh, in other places, in New York, um, the mayor of New York decided that he would keep cinema halls open the new media of the time, because that was the best method to create a um, awareness uh, of what the dangers of the infection were to groups of people. And um, you can see that the transformation of, um, of, tech, of how the new media of the cinema entered public consciousness in a city like New York in the years around the 1917, 18, 19 was very much to do with the result of keeping spaces open. Um, yes, you're right, um, Tasneem. We worked. Uh, we work. We began working with holography, and um, and I hope we will continue. someday. We should have um, many holographic imperial statues grace the gardens and your museum. Um, there will come a day for that. But um, <laughs> but I think that it's also important to think of technology in a more expanded way. Um, Bauhaus, for instance, Bauhaus furniture design was a response to the Spanish flu epidemic. And the people who designed the lean modular structure of what Bauhaus furniture and building design is were responding to the needs to create furniture that was easy to clean. And Tagore in 1921, when he went to Germany, he was very struck by Bauhaus design. And he decided to do an exhibition of Bauhaus design and Bauhaus art in Calcutta in 1922. Now, I think this is a really an, a remarkable situation where at least one of the brightest minds of that time was refusing to play this local game, you know, which our prime minister has asked us to play. He was saying in the, in the aftermath of, a, of an epidemic where there was great fear of contagion, that we need to remain open to the world. Mm. I see this a lot and I, I understand perfectly where uh, Nikhil is coming from because he's embedded in a community that is his world, right? But when a institution of which has a global footprint like the Tate or uh, an institution somewhere else says, oh, now we are going to turn local. I think that they're actually really being in some ways irresponsible mm. because this is a time where instead of shutting down and becoming insular, it's more important to actually try and understand that the condition that the virus produces is not a local one, it's a global one, right? How do we respond to the fact that the virus, and I'm tired of saying this again and again, it now weighs only two grams on the planet. There's only two grams of this virus that afflicts that many million people. <laughs> Trust you to do the statistics. This is the condition we're in. And to, to retreat into some kind of cultural insularity at a time like this, as I think, disastrous. In our cultural moment right now in India, I think we have to take a cognizance of the huge movement of workers across the country. All these people leaving the cities that they built, like Bombay or Delhi or Bangalore, that the people who built the cities are now on the highways is something we have to think about culturally, right? Absolutely. I mean, Nirala did it in 1918, Tagore did it in 1919. There's no reason, there's no excuse for us to think that we can, we who are in, in positions of, of of being able to articulate things culturally that we can shy away from the fact that our cities turned away people, right? So mm. when our museums open, 
how will we reflect on this great turning away how mm-hmm. will we reflect on the fact that 10 and a half million people were on the roads in march right and right. that's a very important it's a, it's a it's something for museum i mean if muse if the task of museums is to think about and to make reality into history then this is reality that needs to be made that needs to be thought about intelligently historically quite right uh, i'm going to now just ask the audience to respond we have quite a few questions um there's a question <clears throat> from pallavi paul some thoughts also on the idea of public space outside the framework of museum and biennale please now this is something also you talk about the streets and all these metros and all these area and i mean you know in in, in a place like bombay especially you look at a chawl the street is really a part of the home of of of, of a chawl you can't say when when public space is how do you so how do you define public space in a sense that goes outside the museum and the biennale there's um and you know would anybody guide you would you like to yeah. you know i yeah. i'd like to i'd like to respond to that one of the things i've never understood is why we've had uh, we've we've been so you know timid in our usage of space uh, why does a city like delhi or mumbai and this is a proposal in fact we have discussed this name for the bhavnadi lad museum before i began doing the video project with you we did a proposal that why can a city like bombay or a city like delhi not have a video project which can actually run through the year it can be a biennale it can be an annual you actually need spaces which people pass through it could be that lovely junction near parel and mahalakshmi where lakhs of people pour out every single day you have a projection which requires a machine and a technician it's a very low cost um an average video made by indian artists is fairly short and it can be seen on your way home and this kind of circulation of an image field of art production uh, is such an obvious thing for us to have have done it doesn't require something like a pandemic to suddenly you know bring out we've been told that right. pandemic has brought out these energies or those energies i mean that's ridiculous this is there is a, we need to have thought of what is to answer palavi's question what is available and this is this is very very eminently doable It, well it's doable <laughs> you speak to someone like shilpa gupta or shireen who who had to when they put up their her work in bandra and the sort of number of hoops they had to jump through you know so the, the street doesn't belong it belongs to us and it doesn't it, in terms of governance it doesn't belong to us so you have to jump through lots of hoops um you know and so there there are and i know all of you are aware of all those issues should i you wanted to come in on that no i mean just the, the chawls in bombay are actually a result of the bubonic plague they were oh, designed yeah, yeah. to accommodate yeah large numbers of people with a combination of light and open space that's why they designed the way they are there's even a rule that the bombay improvement trust had that every public building had to have a 63.5 angle of of how to open to sunlight and it's right. precisely that the violation of those standards that have resulted i mean people don't talk enough about this but there are more people who die in bombay from tuberculosis especially because they live in the new resettlement apartments in uh, govindi and elsewhere where there are epidemiological studies that suggest that if you live on one of the first two ground and first floor of those buildings you're going to get tuberculosis partly mm. because of the circulation issues and partly Absolutely. because there's not enough sunlight and, and air come in so yes. it's yes. important for a for a museum in in bombay for instance to reflect on the fact that design urban uh, housing urban planning and just the angle of sunlight and how you get your you know your fa- you, how you face light is an is a public health question Absolutely. that's public so we were we had we we wanted to have an architecture program and an urban design program for a long time a uh, lot of it depends on on funding and and getting good people who will come in and work with us on these things but i will remember that shiva and i will enlist you in the project uh, there's a question from shuchita grover do you think there could be a move towards cultural internalization of art instead of the explosive 
cross-cultural experience that you become accustomed to. So I'm not sure how you should interpret that, but uh, um, my response to that is I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's another question from Alka Kedia. I agree that the show must go on and it's okay to have digital viewing, but I feel traveling to the place and human interaction facilitated personal growth. Won't that be lost in digital viewing? I think to some extent we have covered that, but perhaps, you know, Gayatri, you might want to... No, to I, I'm, a, I'm a little uh, concerned about um, uh, sort of the value that we uh, place on the digital, the both the positive and the negative. But uh, I think the, the, the placing of an artwork in a white cube space or uh, the formality of the gallery uh, brings with it its own limitations as well. Uh, I, I think that, that, that the supplementing of perhaps uh, an exhibition in a major museum or something would, and not with a, a more informal and a more continuous program of, um, say, Mikhil Chopra working in his community, I might get one film, I might get one program, and then it may be five years before another one comes. And I think there's something that you miss points. So if if you see an object in a, I mean, I've looked at, say, studios like Bharti Kher or something, it's fascinating to see an art object in situ, where it was born. And when you see it in an, in an, somewhere else, it's a completely different viewing experience. And I think that if you, we can have a balance of these, you know, Nikhil, I don't know how many films you've been the subject of or programs where this unself conscious kind of documenting, but the speaking, I mean, same with Shuddha, I mean, how many times does the camera come into your studio and see the work in process? I think the processual and the complete work within the studio has a markedly different quality. It has, it, there's a haptic quality, there's a breathability, there's the presence of the artist. It's not a discrete object. I'm not seeing it with two other hundred, 200 other strangers uh, in a white cube space. And I think that we should possibly try and balance both. That's a great mm -hmm. answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a very positive answer. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question from Steve Correa, which also dwells a little bit on, don't you think even though the inclusion will increase, the amount of people who will actually physically be there and absorb the essence uh, will decrease? Um, so I don't know it. That means perhaps it's talking about the real and the unreal, which we haven't been able to address, authenticity, and where will this whole idea of the authentic experience, because once you have technology that can see, that can create the object in the round, that can uh, go into the kind of detail that the human eye can't see, which you already have, um, how will, Will that experience then modify the experience with the real? Um, I think, and, and, and where will the, the, the real and the unreal, you know, sort of what, which experience will actually be um, more gratifying to a larger audience for perhaps a small group of people like us who are deeply engaged with the art world? We may, we, we will obviously still, uh, want to engage with the actual physical thing. But would, would, would a larger audience, do you think, just, you know, just think, okay, this is, this is far more exciting than going, standing in line at a museum and having to walk around? Or you think that idea of being part of a whole spatial experience, um, also, it will, 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 one would have to think of all these things, will be, will be inspiring. But even that spatial experience, I think, will now be, they're planning to recreate. Uh, and then some of the galleries like Juana and all have already started doing that. So yes, any of you want to comment? Yeah, um, my take on this is that this, this we, sh we do not need to see online experiences or digital experiences as the solution to the problem of the museum. I think that they are very important um, sort of they're important accessories and a lot of museums already have really well done online inventories that you can that you can navigate the they, the question for me is what will 
the what is the role that the digital component of the museum experience play when the footfall comes back as i know it will right mm. what is going to be the relationship between <laughs> your physical experience of the museum and mm. your ability to annotate or to read or to inscribe onto the museum there's a there's an interesting term in museum museological studies now which is called folksonomy sort of it's a, it's a combination of the folk and the taxonomic and it has to do with things that we actually do a lot on instagram or on uh, or on uh, tumblr or another or on music aggregators which is how do people annotate their experience of an object right mm -hmm. they they reinscribe and they reposition uh, a kind of body of growing commentary around objects now mm -hmm. in my understanding museums have to prepare themselves for that transition when the when the footfall begins to happen and the digital platform becomes also a mode of interacting with the experience of being physically present there that will enrich it will bring with it a lot of dangers because all sorts of people will like someone can hack into our zoom right now there will be people who will do that then and with good reason but the broad point is that there has to be a way of thinking about that relationship between digital annotation and physical presence it will happen sooner than we think on that note uh we're at 6 o'clock so that's the difference between if we had been live and sitting in a room together we would have been able to carry on this very very uh stimulating uh thoughtful discussion uh but perhaps we we'll get together again all of us and 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 think about talk about some other subject um as so i want to thank our audiences uh and i want to thank our participants thank you very much nikhil shubha gayatri uh it's been it's been actually very um uh, i must say very reassuring talking to you as a museum director i've been very anxious about how this is all going to play out of course there are big issues around footfall and sanitization and all of that sort of thing but uh, hearing you gives me a lot of hope um and so thank you thank you all of you for that thank you thank you tasneem thank, thank you, you.